Thank you so much for being here. Well, we will get started. Um, my name is Amy Duchelle. I'm a scientist at C4. And on behalf of C4, I would like to welcome you to this discussion forum um, entitled Learning from Red Safeguard Information Systems, Voices from Research Policy and Practice. This is a session jointly organized by C4 and by the Red Social and Environmental Standards Initiative. Respect for rights, promotion of stakeholder participation, conservation of biological diversity and other environmental services, gender equity, promotion of livelihoods, these are all issues that C4 has focused on for many, many years. What's new is that in partnership with the Red Plus Social and Environmental Standards Initiative, we're now more squarely focusing some of the evidence that we've gotten from this previous research and from the Global Comparative Study on Red more directly on Red safeguards, um, not only the international negotiation process, but maybe even more importantly, what's happening on the ground in terms of country-led processes, subnational jurisdictions, and even beyond the forestry sector to look at compatibility between um, safeguards and other principles and criteria. Um, we have a lot of materials in the back that are, are done, uh, uh, provided by C4, the Red Plus SES initiative, other partners on the stage, so please pick those up. And we have a very distinguished group of panelists today. I'm not going to int introduce them. Our moderator is, he is Peter Graham, the leader of the Forest and Climate Program at WWF. Prior to joining WWF, he was um, the co-chair of the UNFCCC negotiations and lead ne red negotiator and policy advisor for the Canadian government. So I will turn this over to Peter. Thank you very much for being here. Um, thank you to the organizers of the GLF. Thank you, Amy. That's uh, very kind. And thank you, everyone, for coming to the session. It is a very important topic uh, for those who have been following RED um, for however long, whether it be just this session or over a number of years. Um, as a uh, former co-chair or chair of the UNFCCC RED negotiations, I'm probably more comfortable being a facilitator than a moderator. Um, I think I'll find out what the difference is over the course of this event and um, hope to generate some active discussion uh, on the topic. And based on the insights of the panelists, and with your help, I think maybe we will be able to come out of this with some really interesting um, information and experiences that we can take forward in implementation, in negotiation, um, and to help the parties and those involved on the ground to respect and address the safeguards from Cancun. Um, at this point, I'm going to, over the course of this, I'm going to try and keep my comments to a minimum. Um, my experience in many of these sessions is that we run short of time to allow questions and a proper discussion with the audience. Uh, and so I'm going to do my best to shut up. Um, and we have presented the panel with three questions. All of this information was on the website for this event, but I'm just going to go through those again. And the first one was, what are the key advances and challenges in implementing in the implementation of safeguard information systems by Red Plus countries. The second question was, how can existing monitoring systems and data sets be leveraged to support safeguard information implementation? And the third question was, who will pay for safeguard information systems? How could these systems allow countries to access emerging financing opportunities associated with Red Plus? So, um, as Amy mentioned, there's a lot of background information research that is available. Um, just a moment, please. Okay, um, our, our sixth panelist will, will come up to the stage while I'm speaking. So, uh, as I said, there's lots of background information available on this, and hopefully, I'm sure you've read it all by now. Um, and the... Um, I'm thinking that the panelists, the quality of their presentations and the ability to, to, um, to get their message across um, will be tested by your, your assessment of which question they're actually answering. And we'll see at the end uh, whether we cover all three and to what extent. So, the, the uh, order of the day will be, um, we're going to, I'll introduce our distinguished guests and then each one will have a maximum of seven minutes to, for their presentation, express their experiences and their views. And then we're going to have a, just a quick exchange amongst the panelists, one question from each panelist to one or more of the others um, to either uh, clarify or, or comment on those presentations. And then at that point, we will open it up to the floor for your questions and comments. 
We have until, uh, as far as I know, 3.45 this afternoon. And um, so at this point, I'm going to start with the introductions. So um, on my left, starting here, we have Joanna Durbin. Um, Joanna is the director of the Climate, Community, and Biodiversity Alliance, otherwise known as CCBA. Um, and it's, this is a partnership of NGOs with a mission to stimulate land management activities that credibly mitigate global climate change, improve the well-being, and reduce the poverty of local communities, and conserve biodiversity. I have known Joanna indirectly for many years, and she's definitely, her work and the work of her organization has influenced the policies around social environmental safeguards for RED, both through World Bank and UN uh, RED organizations over the years, so it's wonderful to have her here. And next to her is Ramiro Batsin. He is the director of COTZIL in Guatemala. Um, he is formerly the indigenous representative on the Consejo Nacional de Cambio Climático and various other um, indigenous uh, councils. You had a number uh, in your bio biography, and so I won't go through them all, but it's, very, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and we look forward to hearing um, your, your views and experience. And next we have Toby Gardner, formerly with Cambridge University, um, now a research fellow with the Stockholm Environment Institute. He is the founder of the Sustainable Amazon Network, which is a network of over 100 researchers, local stakeholders, NGOs, and Brazilian government representatives. This is an organization or network that addresses land use sustainability, and sorry, sustainability challenges in the Brazilian Amazon. And as a, as a point of, uh, um, of notable success, he was awarded the British Ecological Society Founders Prize for a contribution to science of ecology. And next to Toby, we have Novia Wijanintias, sorry for the pronunciation, my apologies. Um, Novia is the head of the Climate Change Division, Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia. And since 1995, which was then the Ministry of Forest, she's been working on forest products inventory, watershed management, and dissemination of research and development. And Novia, um, most crucially at this point, and relevance to our, our, our session here, is that she's been actively involved in the development of the Red Plus Safeguard Information System for Indonesia. And next to Novia, we have M Michael Buki, or Mika, as everyone in the negotiations know him. Um, there's no bio for him, but I've known him for many years, and so uh, he is a policy officer with the European Commission, which as a title doesn't uh, do him justice. He is um, an expert on Red Plus and land use policy in the context of climate change. He has contributed um, innovative thinking to many aspects um, of Red Plus, and uh, it's, it's wonderful that we have him here. And finally, at the end, um, we have Senor Candido Mensua Salazar, and he is the chairman of the National Coordination of Indigenous Peoples of Panama, or CONAPIP. He is also the, uh, the general chief of the Embara Wunan region um, and member of the executive board of the Mesoamerican Alliance of Peoples and Forests. He has extensive experience in pro programs and projects and social and environmental issues, land management, and alternative dispute resolution and international cooperation. And for those of you who are in the main session this morning in this main plenary hall, um, after Helen Clark uh, spoke, um, we had the pleasure of hearing uh, Candido's uh, presentation, his views on the landscape and development agenda, and it was greatly appreciated. It's the most um, eloquent definition of natural capital that I have heard. Thank you. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand it over to the first speaker. We will be going um, almost in order, um, but uh, first with Joanna. And she will give a presentation uh, on country experiences on how the development of safeguard information systems is evolving in the countries she has worked with, and also providing us some um, examples and lessons learned from that. So please, Joanna. Thank you very much. So it, it's, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to share some experiences from the Red Plus Social and Environmental Standards Initiative, uh, working with countries over the last five years. And I prepared this presentation with a, a, a couple of my colleagues who are helping to facilitate the initiative. There's Aurelie Lumeau, who's here. She can wave, hello, and Phil Franks. Thank you. Um, and uh, first, just explain a bit about the initiative. So uh, it, 
over the last five years, we've been supporting countries. In those days, they weren't called safeguards, but now in the design and implementation of a safeguard information system, we've put a big emphasis on an inclusive and multi-stakeholder process and uh, supporting high social and environmental performance of um, Red Plus strategies and action plans. And it's important to stress this is a voluntary initiative. Countries, um, some of them have been using the principles, criteria and indicators and the 10 step uh, multi-stakeholder process of the standards. Um, and others have been participating in the exchange and learning and bringing their uh, ideas and, and practices to, to help generate emerging good practices that um, I'll be sharing some of those now and some of the experiences and, and challenges. Um, so the first thing to stress is that a safeguard information system uh, exists not on its own, but within a, a framework or a, a, a set of other elements that are important for addressing and respecting safeguards. And safeguards are implemented through policies, laws, and regulations within a, a, a country's uh, approach. And then uh, it's also extremely important to have uh, feedback and grievance mechanisms that's accessible and effective. Um, there's a safeguard information system, which is one of the four key elements required under the Warsaw framework for Red Plus. And all of that is, is supported by institutions and processes and procedures. Um, so in the process of developing a safeguards uh, approach, a country would need to work out what are the goals, um, what are we trying to achieve, what do the Cancun safeguards mean in our country? Uh, what are the risks and opportunity of our specific Red Plus strategy and action plans? And are there any other international agreements we've signed up to that are, uh, th that are important? And, and what are our existing laws and policies? Then, in addition, comparing those policies, laws and regulations that they have against what they want to achieve and creating new ones, strengthening them if needed, and also developing the feedback and grievance mechanism. But I'm going to focus now on whoops, this top row, and those of you who've seen this before, this framework is not new. We've been uh, working on it and developing it over the last two years with inputs and, and discussions with UN Red and FCPF and WRI and climate law and policy and, and all the countries, because in fact their experience has led us to sort of disaggregate a bit those steps at the top into these six steps. Then It's not a, 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 a process that has to be done in this way, it's just a way of helping to understand what we're seeing and what's coming out of the countries. So the first one being defining the scope and objectives of the safeguard information system. So questions like what is the information for? Is it just for the UNFCCC and for donors or is it for to attract private sector uh, um, investors? Is it to provide information to national and local stakeholders and to feedback to improve the strategy? Um, and what are the activities that are covered by the safeguard information system? Is it those that are described in the REPLUS strategy or the activities that generate emission reductions? And then it's very important to build on existing information systems. Are there existing systems perhaps linked to policies, laws, and regulations in the country, or reporting to other international agreements, or, and, and what are the gaps in those for what they want to achieve with Red Plus safeguards? And then, what, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's a bit sensitive. So, it's important to establish the institutional arrangements and the processes for stakeholder participation. Are there existing institutional arrangements? Do they cover what's needed? And what stakeholders should be involved in the SIS and, and how? And then you need to identify what specific information is needed. Sometimes it might be helpful to elaborate that in form of indicators and how will they be identified? Um, and then going on to collecting, compiling and analyzing information what methods and processes will be used, where and how will information be collected, by whom, and what type of analysis um, is there going to be to demonstrate that safeguards are going to be addressed and respected. And going on, finally, oops, <laughs> to reviewing, reporting, and using the information. Is there going to be a process of reviewing the, um, the, the information to check that it's accurate, and is that going to involve stakeholders, uh, which, could lead to a more credible 
um, uh, set of information? And then who is the information going to be shared with and how and, and with whom? So going on to some of the country experiences and lessons learned, we've been working with the state of Acre in Brazil. Unfortunately, it doesn't all show there. So uh, they have got to the stage of actually producing a report that's gone through stakeholder review and it's about to be published of assessing their um, progress against a set of very comprehensive indicators that were developed through a multi-stakeholder process. And they found that this multi-stakeholder process helped to ensure the credibility and build political support at all levels um, for, for their work on, for the implementation of safeguards. And also, now they're at the stage of, of sharing that information, they're thinking about what format, language, and strategy for dissemination of reports to the information users. Um, in San Martin, the region of San Martin in Peru, um, they are, uh, they've learned that it's very important to provide capacity building for specific stakeholder groups uh, so that they can engage, engage effectively and to assess and use uh, existing sources of information and link with their uh, information systems. In fact, these, I'll, I'll leave them all up there because uh, this is so sensitive. Um, so uh, these lessons are not only being found in one place or another, they're actually emerging from many countries, but I'm just giving examples from some places. Uh, in Nepal, they found that for each, that their first assessment, it, it was uh, too um, demanding to look at everything and they're in the readiness phase, so they prioritized and went through a very stake, stakeholder intensive participatory process to decide which ones were the most important to look at at this current phase. And in central Kalimantan, uh, they've, uh, they're looking at how different communities and other stakeholders can get involved in, in providing information. So I'm just going to finish with a few final reflections that we're seeing a big difference in policies, laws, and regulations across countries and in the context across countries and capacity across countries. And countries are going about this in different ways, but they're finding that the safeguard information system can uh, have objectives at different levels, have different objectives and at different levels. So for reporting for results-based financing, very important, but also for improving the RED strategy, adaptive management, and for building and maintaining stakeholder and political support for RED. And finally, to, oops, <laughs> to effectively achieve at least two and three, we're finding or they're finding that a multi-stakeholder participatory process is important and the funding for that, uh, and arguably for the first objective as well, looking for credible information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. That was excellent and uh, on time. And um, so I will go without further ado to the next speaker. Um, we have, um, sorry, get back to my right notes here. Um, Ramiro Butzin, Batsin will be talking about um, how to provide, or sorry, provide a view on his experience from Guatemala with the implementation or the design of the Red Plus Safeguard Information System or the experience in the consultation, the process, and the challenge in designing that system. And so, please, Ramiro, we look forward to your, your comments. Thank you. Bueno, en primer lugar, agradecer por la la invitación que se me da para poder hablar un poco sobre el tema de salvaguardas. Antes de entrar, digamos, al caso de Guatemala, es importante ver también que los pueblos indígenas a nivel global están planteando que el tema de salvaguardas Gracias. Bueno, les decía, bueno, con tanta tecnología, a ver si me deja pensar y ordenar lo que iba a decir. Pero bueno, eh, decía que los pueblos indígenas eh, plantean que las salvaguardas es una de las ventanas que le permiten promover el reconocimiento de nuestros derechos, porque los pueblos indígenas venimos hablando más del tema del reconocimiento de derechos colectivos, pero encontramos en el proceso de salvaguardas una ventana que nos pueda eh, permitir, digamos, avanzar en el reconocimiento de estos derechos, particularmente lo que podemos ver con el tema de tierras y territorios, con el tema de consentimiento previo, libre e informado,
con el tema de cosmovisión, con el tema de modelos o sistemas propios de manejo de recursos naturales. Es importante, digamos, ver esto. Actualmente las salvaguardas de Cancún abordan el tema de derecho de pueblos indígenas, pero también crean un reto de crear instrumentos que permitan aplicar esos estándares de instrumentos. Y esos instrumentos que tenemos que establecer tienen que ser como mínimo lo que contempla la Declaración Universal sobre Derecho de Pueblos Indígenas o en su caso el Convenio 169 para los países que tienen ratificado, digamos, este convenio como lo es el caso de, de Guatemala. Los pueblos indígenas de la región también plantean que Red debe garantizar la aplicación del consentimiento previo, libre e informado, lo que crea un reto a los estados nacionales en reconocer a los pueblos indígenas como titulares de derecho, reconocer esos sistemas y estructuras de organización propia, reconocer esos sistemas de justicia y normas y estatutos propios, las formas de vida, reconocer ese buen vivir que de una u otra manera, digamos, en los procesos red no se está entendiendo y no, se, no está habiendo una compatibilidad. Esa forma de ver el mundo, digamos, cómo los pueblos indígenas miramos el mundo, cómo entendemos o cómo concebimos a la madre naturaleza, a la madre tierra, digamos. Es un concepto que hay que verlo y que dentro de las salvaguardas, digamos, tenemos que explicitar cómo van a ser esos procesos. El caso de Guatemala, digamos, los pueblos indígenas que están aglutinados en la Mesa Indígena de Cambio Climático han desarrollado un proceso de diálogo e incidencia fuerte, respecto al tema de red, lo que ha permitido, digamos, que en la eh, actual ley de cambio climático que acaba de ser a finales del año pasado, exista un artículo específicamente que dará el artículo 3, que plantea que la ley y sus reglamentos contendrán las garantías mínimas de cumplimiento al derecho aplicable y de las salvaguardas específicas en el desarrollo de proyectos y programas a implementar. Esto podríamos decir que es la base fundamental, digamos, para desarrollar un proceso de salvaguardas en Guatemala, aunque también crea retos, entre comillas, porque habla del tema del derecho aplicable. ¿Qué es el derecho aplicable? Habla también sobre salvaguardas específicas. Tenemos que definir cuáles son esas salvaguardas específicas. Son retos, digamos, que la ley nos viene a dar y que tenemos que implementar. Dicho proceso también ha permitido la creación e instalación del Comité Nacional de Salvaguardas Red. Aquí tenemos a doña Lola, que es parte, digamos, de ese, de ese comité. Y ese comité está conformado por siete sectores en estos momentos, entre los que aparece academia, ONGs ambientalistas, dependencias gubernamentales, sector privado, mujeres, indígenas y campesinos. Dicho comité creó un grupo facilitador, que es el que está operativizando como desarrollar, digamos, este sistema de salvaguardas. Dentro de ellos aparece, lógicamente, la institucionalidad gubernamental, entre ellos el MARN, el CONAP, el INAV, también están apoyando, digamos, un programa de clima naturaleza en Guatemala, está SOTSIL, UICN y CARE. El año pasado nos hemos dedicado, digamos, a hacer todo un trabajo de fortalecimiento de capacidades y se creó un módulo establecido que contempla cinco grandes eh, módulos, digamos, submódulos de ejecución, uno que fue el tema de cambio climático y red. Primero, entender qué está pasando con la dinámica de cambio climático y con el tema de red a nivel del país, cómo funciona red, digamos, en Guatemala. Aspectos legales y de gobernanza muy importantes, digamos, entender la legislación nacional de Guatemala, cómo la Constitución reconoce el tema de tierras comunales, pero cómo luego no encontramos una ley inferior que la operativice y que le dé, digamos, un dinamismo al reconocimiento. El tema de los instrumentos internacionales, tenemos ratificado el convenio 169, se acaba de ratificar el protocolo de Nagoya, pero no encontramos, digamos, ese link para la hora de, de desarrollar todos esos procesos de eh, implementación. El tema de la participación social, algo fundamental, digamos, que hay que trabajarlo, y dentro de la participación social estamos viendo bastante el tema de derecho de pueblos indígenas, el tema del consentimiento previo, libre e informado, el tema de la resolución de conflictos, que es uno de los puntos fundamentales, digamos, porque se ejecutan proyectos, las comunidades no están de acuerdo con esos proyectos, pero no existe un sistema donde pueda haber un diálogo y resolver esos conflictos que van a crearse, digamos, en su momento. 
Hubo también todo un módulo sobre el tema de salvaguardas ambientales y sociales. ¿Qué significa el tema de salvaguardas ambientales y sociales versus las salvaguardas, entre comillas, llamadas culturales o también derecho de pueblos indígenas? Es importante, digamos, migrar de salvaguardas ambientales a salvaguardas eh, de derecho de pueblos indígenas. Actualmente a Guatemala se le ha aprobado su RPP y últimamente hace un mes y medio, dos meses, se le aprobó su ERPIN. El caso del RPP contempla eh, un capítulo sobre el tema de participación, sobre el tema de consulta y ahorita el ERPIN plantea todo un tema de implementación de lo que es el consentimiento previo, libre e informado. Esto es muy importante, digamos, de que podamos irlo viendo. A raíz de eso se vienen realizando varias acciones, un análisis sobre el contexto de salvaguardas en el marco de la convención, ¿sí? qué significa el contexto de salvaguardas, qué hay en Guatemala sobre el tema de salvaguardas. Se está creando una estrategia que identifique el diseño de los canales de comunicación. Es importante, digamos, ver cómo los canales de comunicación no están funcionando en estos momentos entre los diferentes sectores, cómo cada uno de los sectores tiene intereses particulares sobre el tema de salvaguardas. Se está elaborando también un mapa de actores red, porque es importante decirlo, digamos, en Guatemala vamos a encontrar alrededor de tres tendencias en el tema de red. Una que es, eh, digamos, existe un grupo de implementadores red que están apoyando ya el desarrollo del proceso. Otras organizaciones planteamos que red puede ser si existe el reconocimiento de derechos de pueblos indígenas y existe un tercer bloque que está diciendo no a red porque hay un temor grande, digamos, en qué va a pasar con eso. Es importante que las salvaguardas puedan hacer un diálogo con estos tres sectores y que puedan definir, digamos, un proceso de fortalecimiento. Y aquí juega un papel importante, digamos, qué va a ser el fortalecimiento sobre el tema de la institucionalidad gubernamental. ¿ya? Cómo ese marco legal va a fortalecer a la institucionalidad, llámese CONAP, MAR, MAGA y en este caso, digamos, INAV también, que son los que están trabajando el tema de bosques, el tema de red, pero es importante fortalecerlos porque debe haber una estrategia unificada que reconozca, digamos, esos derechos de pueblos indígenas. Por otro lado, tenemos toda una institucionalidad indígena que hoy no existe, digamos, un diálogo y que hay que acercar esos diálogos entre las instituciones de gobierno que trabajan el tema de pueblos indígenas y las instituciones de gobierno que trabajan el tema de derechos, de, perdón, de, del tema de medio ambiente y recursos naturales. Entonces, el tema de las salvaguardas en Guatemala se crea como una instancia que pueda permitir ese reconocimiento de derechos y que pueda avanzar a las, de permitirle a las organizaciones y pueblos indígenas realmente encontrar una alternativa que apoye la conservación de los bosques y que reconozca el tema de las tierras comunales. Gracias. Thank you very much, Ramiro. Uh, um, I think your experience as a journalist came out there and getting many messages across uh, very clearly. I'll just actually reflect on one of them regarding the, the legal context of each country, each region, and when I was involved in the negotiations of the safeguards that ended up being adopted in Cancun, that a lot of the difficulty was around how to, how to accommodate at that point at a national level the different legal frameworks in different countries for Uh, particularly indigenous people's rights, uh, but also just generally the, the, the social environmental safeguards. So thank you for that. Um, and to, to follow from that perspective, um, we're very, very happy to have Candido Mesua Salazar here and um, very interested in your views and experience from Panama and also in your involvement in the broader indigenous community um, internationally um, on the implementation of safeguard information systems or the safeguards themselves. So. Um, Señor Candida, please. Gracias. Cuando hablamos de salvaguardas desde el punto de vista de pueblos indígenas, para nosotros representa una forma, un sistema de cómo proteger la vida de nuestra población. Cuando hablamos dentro del marco de una iniciativa red o cualquier iniciativa red, entonces se convierte que las normas que favorecen los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, llámese el marco internacional, el convenio 169 o la declaración, se convierten en estándares de salvaguardas para los pueblos indígenas. En el caso de Panamá, las leyes comarcales 
también se convierte en nuestros estándares que deben ser respetados por cualquier programa de iniciativa global. Entonces, ¿qué estamos diciendo? Que para poder establecer salvaguardas deben ser estándares plenamente reconocidos, tanto en el marco internacional como en el marco nacional. Los programas de iniciativas red, ONU Red, FCPF o cualquier otra iniciativa también deben atender el respeto de derechos de pueblos indígenas. Planteamos entonces que un primer elemento dentro de la salvaguarda es el reconocimiento de la identidad de los pueblos indígenas. Ese reconocimiento implica una serie de derechos consuetudinarios que van mucho más allá de la norma reconocida legalmente. Van a un derecho cultural antes de cualquier norma. Entonces, este es el principal elemento que debe estar involucrado como marco de salvaguarda. El segundo elemento que debe estar involucrado dentro de este proceso es la necesidad de establecer un marco claro y definido de las consultas, pero en el caso de Panamá va mucho más allá, va hasta emitir el consentimiento. No solamente basta estar informado, no solamente basta que se consulte, sino que también es sumamente importante que se defina por qué razón estoy o no de acuerdo con un programa o con un proyecto y más que todo con una iniciativa global que va a afectar y viene desde un posicionamiento político global, regional, pero que impacta en lo local y más aún todavía en lo territorial. Entonces, por ello nosotros decimos, la salvaguarda base arranca con la consulta y el consentimiento. No se puede establecer un programa sin que las poblaciones indígenas puedan definir qué es lo que quieren. El segundo elemento, dentro de esto, ahora involucra entonces la participación. Como marco de la garantía de la salvaguarda, la participación plena y efectiva, ¿cómo se da? debe darse en todas las etapas y procesos que conlleva el programa. Y por ello es que decimos, si nosotros no estamos como una garantía en las tomas de decisiones, entonces la salvaguarda no tiene efectividad. ¿Por qué? Porque las decisiones de los programas se dan al más alto nivel, se dan en los tomadores de decisiones. Y si la salvaguarda no establece como un marco de referencia que los pueblos indígenas tienen toma de decisión en cualquier programa, entonces no tenemos, como se dice, un, un vínculo de decisión que permita orientar o definir algún programa. Ejemplo está el caso que pasó en Conapit, Panamá, pueblos indígenas y el gobierno de Panamá. Voluntariamente accedimos de manera, como se dice, consciente y de manera inconsciente a apoyar un programa que nos prometió todo, porque en su iniciativa temprana no se tenía con claridad qué es lo que iba a hacer el programa como tal. Estamos hablando del programa ONURED en su primera fase. Después de varios años nos consideramos que nuestros derechos habían sido vulnerados, que los eh, la participación no era plena ni efectiva que no se nos consultó ni tomábamos parte de las tomas de decisiones y que mucho menos teníamos la participación en la construcción misma de, de qué es red para nosotros en definitiva no había un sistema de salvaguarda propiamente que garantizara todos estos aspectos y sobre todo porque no hay una claridad en el programa, no había una claridad en el programa como tal. Entonces, ¿qué se define? Las salvaguardas es un parámetro estándar para que para los pueblos indígenas debe ser el máximo nivel, no el mínimo. Porque al parecer, en el marco de las estándares de salvaguarda de red se establece como un estándar mínimo aceptable. No, debe ser el máximo aceptable. 
en este sentido, la salvaguarda, el sistema debe buscar un mecanismo entonces de asegurar que se cumpla un mecanismo de cumplimiento. Porque no había forma de cómo verificar si era, era aceptable o se estaba cumpliendo. Cuando intentamos los pueblos indígenas de Panamá demandar al sistema de Naciones Unidas, ¿a quién nos estábamos enfrentando? Demandar a las 194 naciones miembros de Naciones Unidas. Un sistema de Naciones Unidas que debe salvaguardar los derechos de pueblos indígenas. Entonces, hay situaciones que ahora estamos viendo, no estábamos preparados. Es necesario entonces tener las reglas claras. Y el primer elemento de todo esto es, el sistema debe tener un sistema de mecanismo de cumplimiento. Pueden estar los estándares nacionales o los internacionales, pero si no hay un sistema de cumplimiento que asegure ese estándar, no va a avanzar. Los derechos son primero. Gracias. Thank you very much. That was very, uh, very informative, and the experience um, is invaluable, especially when it came to, and to the, the example you gave in the question of who do you, who do you appeal to when you feel you are being wronged as a community or as a, as a society. And um, that, of course, is a key key part of a safeguard information system in, in its, sounds like a technical construct, but in reality, it needs to be clear for every person on the ground that they know who to go to to, uh, to, to have their rights respected through this process. So thank you. Um, so without further ado, I'll move on to um, Toby Gardner, who will delve into some of the design elements um, of a good safeguard information system, hopefully building on what we've heard so far. Um, and uh, basically, the question is, how do you work with what you have to design an effective safeguard information system at various scales? Toby. Thank you, Peter. Um, is it working? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to be hearing my, my colleagues start off. I think that the language of safeguard and the language of information don't do justice to the importance of the, of the issues that we're talking about, as, as Ramiro and Camino have just, have just eloquently told us. Um, safeguard itself suggests something reactive, and information suggests something that will just be archived and not necessarily used. So I think critical to thinking about any technical issue is thinking hard about what is the most effective and realistic way in which a participatory process that can liberate uh, and, and uh, give access to the kind of information that is not, um, it's not a check and balance, it's not, uh, it's not even a, a safeguard in the sense of avoiding risks um, and trying to capitalize upon co-benefits, but instead it's a precondition to a process being effective, uh, being sustainable, and being legitimate. Um, so in that sense, I just wanted to share a few thoughts on the differentiated uh, kind of entry points that can already be tapped into to start, even if it's in a, uh, in a very preliminary and embryonic way, to start uh, getting access to the processes and the kinds of information that are so critical to RED. And the first point I just wanted to flag that came out of some work that a few of us did uh, a couple of years ago now for the, for the, for the UN RED Plus process um, is highlighting, again, that this, a lot of the discussions around uh, safeguard information systems are related to monitoring and assessment. But there is a prior stage of planning uh, where and what kinds of red activities are being talked about. And the information uh, regarding safeguards, social and environmental attributes, and their distribution um, across space in the top there, and the way in which uh, our expectations of how different um, Red Plus activities are likely to affect those, those values and those attributes for better or worse uh, needs to be thought about uh, before any, any implementation is carried out and certainly before uh, we worry about monitoring. And that can identify both potential trade-offs, conflicts, uh, it can identify perhaps issues where the process needs to be halted uh, and reversed uh, and go back, to, go back to an earlier point of consensus. 
And then once that's in place, then a process of assessment can be thought about. And, and, and again, uh, key here is, as, as Joanna was saying at the beginning, is a key aspect of being feasible is tapping into systems that already exist. So most of the money and most of the interest, of course, behind Red Plus is being driven by reduced emissions, reduced land-based emissions. So any new data that's to be collected needs to tap in to an analogous uh, conceptual framework and process. And, and so understanding how forests and landscapes change and linking work that identifies how those changes impact on emissions factors and responses, measured responses of environmental and social uh, values can be done in close partnership. Um, the second point, oh, that's the third point. Oh, that's the first point again. The second point uh, is similarly to the conception of Red, Red Plus as a phased tiered implementation process then we should also, I think, think about uh, safeguard information systems. We should think about these critical, uh, these critical measures of, 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 of values, of risks, uh, of, uh, of, of key system attributes um, in, in a tiered way. So even if the depth of information that we really need is not available, in order to start that participatory process that's so critical uh, to giving the, the, the system uh, and the proposal legitimacy, and to start putting these critical social and environmental issues on the table as early as possible, then we need to use what we have. And in many cases, they may be global uh, data sets, they may be national data sets, they may be secondary data sources, but there's plenty of information out there. My work uh, on my own side has been more on the, on the biodiversity end, um, but there's plenty of information that we can already use without needing to reinterpret the wheel, uh, reinvent the wheel. Um, and the third point, uh, and perhaps my, my, my key point here, is that um, a lot of work on, on monitoring uh, often assumes that we need to collect everything possible everywhere. So if we take biodiversity as a quintessentially complex issue, um, and collecting information on what Red Plus activities involve in a given place, what the direct impacts of those activities are, let's say a sustainable forest management action uh, program, and then also trying to collect detailed information on how species and populations are responding to that management program is unfeasible to do everywhere. So that's what I'm calling here in this, in this slide, direct performance related information. So information on the actual values that we care about, that we want to, that we want to nourish and that we want to protect uh, above carbon. Um, can be done in certain projects, but ultimately our national understanding or our regional understanding of how well uh, a given area is doing, a given process, a given project is doing, has to be based on what we see to be, good, be as good practice. And whether that's manifest in a certification or whether that's manifest in a, in a, in a, in a, in a shared appreciation of what good practice is by uh, a, a group of traditional people or an indigenous people, it doesn't matter, but it has to be based on uh, our appreciation of what, what good practice is. And then we can use... Mm -hmm. No, this has stopped working. Okay, there we go. We can use information at the project scale to iteratively calibrate uh, what our understanding of a good practice system is. It will never be perfect. The concept of a sustainable, sustainable system I don't think should be seen as a blueprint. Uh, it should be seen as a direction of travel. So if we recognize that from the outset, that there are always improvements that we can make and that we will always require, built into the process, an iterative calibration. And we can draw on detailed project scale information in order to, in order to achieve that. And that can then feed in to our understanding of the system at the national level. Of course, there are measurements that can be ta taken, proxies. Uh, I work a lot in Brazil. Brazil has excelled itself uh, in developing national uh, or biome level monitoring systems that can provide a really good, in, good interpretation of how things are going. But it's not the detailed information as to the health of the, the forest. It's not the detailed information as to um, the negative or positive impacts on the well-being of the more marginalized communities that you can get from those uh, mapping or satellite-based exercises. So we need that calibration exercise as well. Oh. And the final step is then that can that can feed into the, into the international level. So my key point is that given what we've heard already, uh, and I'm sure what many of us believe, that we shouldn't see these, uh, these, these, these vital signs 
uh, of ecosystem health or of, of, of well-being of, of, of local people um, as being a reactive check and balance, but as preconditions to the system working well. And given that as a starting point, we need to find practical, uh, incredible ways to enter the process as soon as possible, tiered pro process, think about spatial patterns as well as temporal, uh, uh, temporal monitoring, and think about the way in which we can use information on how well we manage ecosystems, as well as our assessments of what that management system really means in order to get going. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Toby. I won't try and sum up, but one thing that I'm going to mention now is a question that we can sort of maybe answer later when we get back to it. But linking the discussions from Aviro and Candido, um, it's you've taken it from somewhat of a uh, your initial focus was on environmental aspects of the social environmental safeguards. And they brought up a lot of issues related to the social side, so I'm going to be interested to hear from you later on perhaps about how you would, might integrate uh, traditional knowledge and systems into such a system. But um, I'll leave that for later. Um, so next um, we have Novia, um, who will give us provide us with um, a presentation on her experience with the development of a safeguard information system in East Kalimantan and how that, how the challenges and um, issues that come up with uh, the linking of that subnational system to the national level. And also, if possible, at the end, some cost implications um, from the perspective of government. Novia, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to share our experience in uh, developing the SIS for Red Plus in Indonesia. And uh, this picture is uh, basically the, the whole process that conducted uh, during the last three years, probably more, since the 2011. And the first lesson is that information provision system, the principal criteria and indicator for SIS, Red Plus, and tools for assessment, uh, safeguards implementation are uh, developed based on the existing systems. And this is taking into account policy and other relevant instruments. And as we can see in this picture, Indonesia started with identification, identification and analysis of the existing relevant policy and instruments. We have uh, EIA or we call it AMDAL, KLHS, uh, FBIC and so on. And then uh, we come up with seven uh, principles, 17 criteria and 32 indicators and also a set of assessment tools and and uh, today we have uh, already a web platform to provide the information. And uh, from our experience, we also acknowledge the importance of multi-stakeholder processes for broader groups of Red Plus actors in Indonesia. And the involvement of multi-stakeholders in the iterative process of SIS development promotes transparency and participation and also increase the confidence of the diverse actors. And uh, this involvement of diverse actors since in the beginning of the process is very important since it creates a sense of ownership and acceptance and ensure that the output fits within the national and subnational context and then can be applied effectively. We also found that during the exercise of the SIS at the subnational level, uh, we have exercise in two provinces. The first one in, in East Kalimantan and the second one is in Jambi province. Uh, we found that, that there's opportunity to link the system at the, at the national level to uh, several provinces uh, where forest-related information systems are in place or under development. And one of the examples uh, I pick uh, in this presentation is the case from East Kalimantan, where the province and district-based forest information system are now under development by local government in collaboration with our partner, uh, GIZ for Climb. And uh, we also uh, 
see here opportunity to integrate or synergize uh, the work uh, between the system with other safeguards initiatives uh, developed in East Kalimantan like uh, Red Plus SES, uh, what Ibu Joanna presented before, and also PRISAI, uh, Principal Criteria and Indicator of Red Plus Safeguards Initiative developed by uh, Red Plus Agency of Indonesia. So I think this picture is uh, uh, a more simple model, model that has been uh, presented before by uh, Toby. Uh, this is the, the general uh, model. And uh, uh, we have provincial model and also a district-based uh, forest information system in East Kalimantan. This is now under development. Oh, sorry. Oops. Sorry, why? No. Okay. Uh, on another perspective, we found that SIS Red Pass also uh, can be used to bridge safeguards interests at the international level with local or national level by internalizing global guidance in existing systems and mechanisms in Indonesia. And uh, also, we can use uh, SIS uh, as a, an externalization. So not in, uh, in another way, uh, we can use uh, the assisting process in Indonesia to support the negotiation and implementation at international level. So uh, we have internalization and also externalization uh, on SIS Red Plus. So, with regard to the involvement of global institutions and donors, because there are some donors involved in uh, the SIS development, those that have or are currently developing their own safeguards framework would benefit from aligning them with those developed by Red Plus countries to its implementation. And I give an example here, uh, a chart, a pie chart, uh, that shows initial investment uh, for national SIS Red Plus development and subnational trial in two provinces in Indonesia since 2011 to 2014. And this is very rough approximate uh, calculation because I try to count, uh, to calculate in US dollars. And uh, this uh, take form of on um, capacity building and then also from the, the, the stakeholders communication, stakeholder consultation, expertise, and uh, consultant hiring, and also uh, web development. Uh, this is just to, 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 to show the, the, the value of uh, contribution of uh, our partners, donors. And there are some upcoming challenges uh, in front of us. The one is that Keeping the system operational will be very challenging, uh, since we have to managing uh, we have to manage database and web platform in a sustainable way, and this will uh, demand for patient dedication and sufficient resources, including human resource. So uh, the need for support is there, and also uh, we found from our exercise in East Kalimantan and also in Jambi that we need to increase uh, the capacity of uh, human resources uh, at the sub-national level. And also, uh, the one that is very important is the commitment of responsible institutions. So in the process of developing uh, SIS, we also uh, design the structural uh, design structure and organizational and institutional uh, structure of the SIS. And we found that the commitment of uh, assigned our responsible institutions is very important. Otherwise, we can not uh, move forward uh, with the SIS. And the third one is that uh, there will be more work to do uh, in integrating results of parallel processes relating to safeguards and SIS development. Um, we have. SES, we have PRISAI, we have maybe some other 
uh, initiative related to safeguards Indonesia and the integration, uh, uh, the the synergy and uh, integration of all of these parallel processes will be very challenging and then uh, supports are needed. And I would like to to close uh, this presentation with a question, because <laughs> this is our question. Will the initial investment has been uh, set in our SIS development be sufficiently rewarded, probably by performing this payment, as Indonesia now have this um, uh, progress. Uh, we have also some other safeguards initiative on progress now, like Ibu Joanna has uh, explained before. So will this all investment in SIS development in Indonesia be sufficiently rewarded? So I think this all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Novia. That was an excellent pleasant presentation. Um, two remarks. One of the things uh, I have been involved in this Red Plus UNFCCC process since the beginning, and um, it takes stamina and patience um, and some bit of craziness, but not necessarily seeing emissions reductions happening that quickly certainly was a you know, a challenge for the psyche to stay involved. But there was progress along the way and different types of progress. And I have to say in Indonesia, um, their recognition through the process of Red Plus of indigenous peoples at the national level, the government's recognition and implementing a law recognizing them um, was, you know, it was just an amazing thing to see happen, excuse me. Um, and, and having maybe, you know, of course there was a, a, a social movement underneath that, but perhaps read and the negotiations and this catalyzed that and, and so it was it was very rewarding to see that. Um, one other thing before I move on to Mika, um, it was very interesting and that was that um, international institutions or um, governments who are involved in bilateral programming should design their safeguards based on your experiences, the country's experiences with implementing them and that um, is I think something that to, to remark upon in, in, the, in our discussion because it is a, that is definitely not the way um, that has, in my experience, um, been happening. So that's, uh, we'll, we'll see if that's food for thought. And so I'll move on to Mika. Um, and um, he's going to be building on, if I believe, um, the issue is related to, to finance and safeguard information systems. And looking forward about uh, with how is the Green Climate Fund perhaps going to address um, the safeguard information systems, the, their existence and their quality, um, or other aspects. So Mika, please. Can you hear me? No? no. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Amy. Thanks to the, to the C4. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, indeed, I will, I will try to answer to Novia's question, which resonates with the question put forward yesterday by uh, Pakeru. Do we want um, a red Ferrari or do we want a red uh, Tata Nano, we called it? So what, what type of red do we want and, and how much qualitative elements we want to red plus and can we afford these, these qualitative elements? Um, and if we want that, uh, who's going to pay and how much? Um, so I, I'd like to stress first that uh, these are just personal views. Uh, it's not stating any uh, official position of, of anyone or anything. Um, so um, before I talk about how are we going to pay and who's going to pay? I'd like to be very clear on the other W questions. And the first one is what? We are talking about the seven Cancun safeguards. Not on, it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's, it's clearly understood that not all information that is collected at national level uh, can and will be used at the international level. So what I'm talking here in this presentation is the bit of information that make it to the international level and that will inform a decision to pay or not to pay from a, from a Red Plus donor country. Uh, that's, that's different from the, the myriad of uh, principal criteria and indicators that might be developed, uh, may or may not be developed at the national level. Uh, it's also different from the, the due diligence that would have to or may or may not apply from um, financing institutions such as uh, pu public or private banks. What I'm talking here is really what is 
these systems that we need at the end of the chain to build up the summary of information that is one of the mandatory elements on which we base the decision to pay or not pay. <coughs> and I must say, we don't have a lot of experience in that at the moment. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there is only one summary of information that has been uh, put online, a draft Brazilian summary of information on safeguards. And, and it looks like that. Uh, well, not really looks like that, but uh, that, that's, that's how it looks if you make it a word cloud. Um, and I was, I was looking at the 40 pages document and, and trying to make sense of it. And, and does it answer to my question? And I must say, I don't know. I don't know. For two reasons. First, I don't speak Portuguese. <laughs> and, <laughs> My wife does, and, but I'd rather not understand when she talks with her mother. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's not easy to tell at the moment whether uh, this summary is enough for me. Um, uh, so maybe it would be good at a later stage to translate it in French, Spanish, and, and English because the learning value is huge, of course. And then more importantly, it doesn't matter if I like it or not. What matters to me, really, is if the Brazilian society, all the relevant stakeholders around, uh, like it, whether they are comfortable with the information that is provided. And, and that's a little harder to assess. But speaking of just my own um, expectation for what I would find in the, in the summary of information, uh, we could break down the, the seven safeguards. I mean, it's, it's a negotiation text. It's open for interpretation by anyone, and my guess is as, as good as yours. Uh, uh, but, okay, what, what I would be looking at is whether the Red Plus framework in the country, driven by a country driven, by, 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 by stakeholders in the country, by the governments, uh, whether I'm confident that it will prevent possible conflicts. And there can be many conflicts. There can be, of course, the worst conflicts, which are human conflicts, <coughs> uh, sometimes um, casualties. Uh, that's, that's, that's the worst one. But there are also economic conflicts, conflicts of interest between different uh, groups um, um, in the country or outside the country. There could be conflicts between different levels of law, customary laws, national laws, international relevant agreements. And I would like to have some trust that these conflicts have been prevented as far as possible. Um, that talks to information such as governance, law and institutions, planning, communication, uh, grievance and redress mechanisms. This type of information I trust will be useful no matter what. I think maybe they are not completely developed, but they, they will need to be developed over time uh, so that any policy in the country uh, is useful in the forest sector. So I guess this information, although maybe it doesn't exist in the shape and flavor that we would like to see, already exists somewhere. Then there is another block of, of concern is preserving, enhancing non-carbon benefits, uh, adaptation, um, uh, resilience, uh, health and development, all these things. Here again, I guess this information exists. It can certainly be developed. It can certainly be adapted to the, to the needs of uh, Red Plus uh, SIS. But I, I guess it is somewhere. And then the last one, uh, and maybe the most complicated one, in my view, uh, as a scientist, is avoiding that the success we achieve in, in Red Plus mitigation is lost over time or is just um, uh, makeshift, that it, it just uh, gives a false impression of good mitigation because emissions will happen just later or, or because uh, they will be displaced to the next country or to the next region. And that, that is a, more, a bit more tricky. I'm not sure that the information uh, exists, or if it exists, it's very partial. So how do we get nationally relevant information about that? To me, that remains a challenge. Um, sorry. Then another question is when. When do we get this information, or when do we get to the point where the, the national, uh, the SIS is ready? And um, I don't know. Here again, um, it, it's, it's something we will learn uh, in light of experience. But this, what is on screen at the moment, is the, the text from the uh, UNFCCC decision regarding national forest monitoring systems. And to me, it fits quite well to what I would expect from the SIS, uh, that it builds upon existing systems as appropriate, uh, that it enables the assessment of, of natural forests as defined by the party, 
that it is flexible and that it allows for improvement, that it reflects as appropriate the, the phased approach to Red Plus, that you, you will start with something and, and it will grow along uh, the development of, the, of implementation in the country, and that it may provide information to the SIS or, or the other way around, that the SIS could provide relevant information for the National Forest Monitoring System. I think there, 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 there is room for connections and integration. I believe it so much that uh, I and other uh, GRC colleagues committed a paper uh, a few years ago on here we go on on how countries at early stages or with low capacity in red plus could could start uh, developing their their framework of definitions for forest and for different activities in red plus uh, and and integrate these and I, I still believe that if you follow this logic that you will uh, uh, prioritize your Red Plus activities in a way that is uh, beneficial to natural forest and to biodiversity, you will already uh, have made a long way towards uh, a meaningful uh, implementation of Red Plus towards healthy ecosystems and resilient ecosystems. I mean ecosystems which are able to uh, keep delivering or provisioning uh, services to people and that are able to withstand um, uh, climate extremes in the future. So that, that's, that's key, uh, and probably there are many ways to do that, but I, I think that the intersect between uh, National Forest Monitoring System and SIS uh, is, is something still to explore. Um, now, we come to really the, the core of the presentation. Uh, it's the second to last slide. How? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to finance uh, SIS. So what I did is I spent my afternoon yesterday talking to everyone I knew in the rooms and asking them how do you think uh, we should or we could finance SIS. And I got a, a lot of very interesting answers. The first one is, uh, it's not a very good one, it's, 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 it varies. It varies depending on the country, of course. It's, it's, it doesn't help us much, but it can be very different what, you, what it will require to, good, to build a good SIS in, in Amazon, in, sorry, in, uh, in Brazil, might probably be very different from what it would require uh, in uh, one of the least developed countries. Uh, there, there, is, there is really, uh, there is no one fixed cost uh, for the Rolls Royce or the Ferrari of SIS. Uh, first, uh, it's very variable depending on what you have, and we're not sure exactly yet what is the Rolls Royce for SIS. I'm speaking too much about cars, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't like cars. Um, so <laughs> now only very few people were, in it, were able and willing to give me a figure, but some did, and they told me it would be up to $1 million to the cost that we we'll need for the upfront uh, uh, design and implementation of SIS, just the, the early stages of that. But then, of course, the, you, you will need to add uh, to that for each update, you will need to add more information, you will need to review and improve, and you will add each time 10 to 20% of that. So maybe 100 or 2,000, 100 or 200,000 uh, dollars every two or four years when you report. So it's not, it's not a minor cost, and, and it's, it's recognized. Um, other uh, from the private sector told me the price is irrelevant because if you don't do the safeguards, you don't do red, and that's yet that. You, it, it, it's, it's significant, it's true, but it's not one on which you can spare. So otherwise, it, it will have no value on the market. Another consideration is that it may cost more time than money. Uh, it may it may cost training people and consulting and organizing uh, lengthy processes, inclusive processes, participative processes. Uh, and and it's, it that just takes a room and a, and a few computers. I mean, it's not that you would, you, you would build huge uh, data warehouse, uh, Google type of thing, uh, and super web platform. The really difficult part of it is to get the right people in the right room and provide the information in advance and make sure that they have the time to read it, uh, process it, and come back and be representative of whatever constituency they are from. So that process in itself is, is, uh, takes a lot of energy and time. Another consideration is that uh, it's part of, the, of good policy management or program management anyway. Uh, a lot of the information that are required in the safeguards, they will be required for any policy or any project to work. That's, that's part of what you have to do. 
And then um, the, the last point, and the one on, on, will, on which I will um, conclude, is that a fraction, I mean, the, the, SI, the cost of the SIS is high, it's understood, but it's still lower than what it takes to have a good MRV. And, um, and the benefits of developing a very good safeguard information systems are at least comparable to the benefits of a good MRV system. And I, I will prove that with some figures in the last slide. If we get to the last slide. Here we are. So that's the last slide. Um, it's a heavy one because I was limited to a uh, few slides, four actually, and I made seven, so I felt I had the need to compress the last one. But there are two, two parts. The, the, last, the, the left part is about um, how we are going to pay uh, for emission reductions under the Climate Fund. That's, that's public information. You can go online, you can see the metrical framework of the Climate Fund. And what it says is that the country will produce a certain amount of emission reductions but the carbon fund will not pay for all of these. There will be uh, discounts because we, we anticipate that there will be some risk and some precautions need to be taken in relation with those risks. And I do believe that the information provided by the safeguard information systems will inform us on how sustainable the country approach is. And it has a very strong influence on how much carbon could be sold in the end. Uh, actually, between 45 and 90% of the carbon that is generated and transferred to the carbon fund uh, will, be, will be sold. So it's a factor two. Basically, if you, if you do the very, very basic MRV and very little on the sustainability aspects, you will get twice less than if you, do, if you did the perfect um, um, risk-proof version of Red Plus. So I, I think it's, it's a very, very strong incentive. On top of that, the, the price, the total price um, it's, we, are, we have not set a figure yet, but um, my, my own sense is that the more confidence we build in the Red Plus product, uh, the higher the, the, the uh, attractivity, attractivity of Red Plus will become compared to other mitigation options, and the more demand there will be, and therefore uh, the, the higher the price will be. So not only it changes the volume, but it also changes the, the price. And now talking of the total amount of finance, <clears throat> the, last, the last graph uh, I borrowed from uh, a recent meeting uh, at the World Bank, uh, also speaking about the coordination of finance for Red Plus. And so it shows you the amount of finance that will go in Red Plus uh, over time. And you see that there will be always some technical assistance phase one capacity building type of investment and probably the, the lower one uh, at the bottom. That, that's, that's the type of money that we will need to build the early stages of the, of the, um, of the SIS. Uh, and then on top of that, you will get more money from Red Phase 2 and Red Phase 3, uh, which is at the top. But the bulk, the real bulk of uh, the money that would come from Red Plus will be a shift between unsustainable investments and sustainable investments. That's, that's really where the value of Red Plus is to me that we can catalyze with the information we get from Red Plus and from the SIS and from the, the National Forest Monitoring Systems, that we can catalyze smarter investments from the public and private sector. That's really the challenge in Red Plus, and that's where the value of, of uh, the SIS is and where the money for the SIS could come from. You could say, okay, we, we decide to put a tax on unsustainable practices. That, that will be one way of hurting the, the red part of the graph. Or you could say, we are going to promote the least controversial sourcing area. And actually, it's, it, it used to be a kind of a, of a dream uh, two years ago, but now you have the BioCF uh, Initiative for Sustainable Forest Landscapes that goes in that direction. Uh, VCS is developing a landscape production standard that also goes in that direction, and they would feed from information from Red Plus to tell to Unilever and all these companies which are, which are investing uh, in land use activities uh, in the tropics. That's, that's safe. This region or this country is safer. If you, if you invest there, you can increase agricultural productivity without increasing deforestation and degradation. And that's a very strong message because it's much, much bigger than Red Plus. Red Plus is the icing on the cake, but the cake can be very, very big. Uh, and so the financial impacts of a good SIS, I think, are worth the cost, to answer your question. I think they are, they, they, 
they are and they must be worth the cost. And we will do our best for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mika, and thank you. Um, and as I said, an innovative thinker. And there are a couple of things in there I'll just comment on while I let uh, people prepare their question um, for other panelists, and we'll have a couple of minutes to respond. But just to take for a couple of things from what Mika was uh, presenting. First, thank you. You did answer the question, uh, taking an innovative um, uh, survey approach uh, to, to the task. Um, and I also thank you for bringing us into the context of the landscape um, that we're in right now in the Global Landscapes Forum and, and acknowledging that there are non-mitigation benefits um, to implementing good safeguards, monitoring, reporting, or monitoring them and reporting them and making sure they're effective. That comes to your story about, um, uh, what was it? Um, it's not a matter in terms of the summary of information on how safeguards are, are respected and addressed, or addressed and respected. It's whether the, the people of the country agree. Um, and this actually reminds me of my first year in forestry school in New Brunswick in Canada when we were out in the field and we were being asked by the professor, how far, how close to the stream should we allow the logging? And the students are looking at the topography of the hill, well maybe at the top of the hill, no maybe about you know 50 meters from the top of the hill away. And then somebody, I think it was probably the professor because we were first year university students and we weren't very smart, he said, well, why don't you ask the stream <laughs> how far the logging should be to determine uh, what the impact will be. So similar to your question, why not ask the, the people um, whether the safeguard information system and the application of them is, is, is effective. So thank you for that. And now I'm going to hand it back to the panelists. This is a way of making my job easier. Um, and reflecting on the other panelists' presentations, the comments, um, what is your one question for one or more of them, um, or comment, um, if you have to reflect on it. So I'll start in order of, of presentation. Joanna, please. Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I had more than one. <laughs> if, if there's time, we can come back. OK. Um, so I thought, uh, Toby, it was interesting. You, you had this model of how you uh, would need and, and could collect and could probably justify more detailed information at a project level uh, than might be needed or uh, it would be appropriate at a national level. And you were thinking about that in terms of biodiversity information. But uh, I would say that that seems to resonate also with, with social information. And somebody in an earlier panel, I wrote it down because I thought it sounded so good, that if you don't measure, you can't manage. You know, so that the management unit whether it's project scale or jurisdictional, sub-national, is going to need some management information to know if, how, it, how its management is meeting its objectives and, and how it needs to adapt that. Uh, it, it sort of comes a bit to Mika's thing about how much should these things cost, because part of the cost is actually part of the cost of management. It's not just an extra additional cost that we have to do for those external UNFCC summaries. Um, and then you would expect perhaps more detail at the, at the local or the sub-national level for Novia than, than you might need for the SIS you know, coming up. Um, and, uh, and, and stakeholders at the very local level might need a different kind of and, and more detailed information than, than is needed at the top level. So I guess the, I don't know if it's a question, it's more like a comment, but uh, just to say, have you seen that this uh, it would be relevant for social information as well as biodiversity information? Thank you, Joanna. Toby, you'd like to start? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> simply, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pragmatic thing. We can't collect detailed um, direct performance information at, at every single place, but we do need them to calibrate our understanding of what good practice is as determined by, by anybody. So we need some intelligent approach that balances uh, collecting uh, those detailed data to ensure that what we conceive to be good practice really is and do that iteratively. Um, I mean, my concern is that the vast majority of monitoring data, whether social, environmental, that are collected are never used because we've spent far much more time thinking about how and not enough time thinking about why. So I think the why is, is uh, 
sidelined, and we need to give a lot more attention to that. Okay. Thank you. Ramiro. Sí. Question, please. Eh, dos cosas que estaba planteando Michael y que son interesantes de analizar. Uno en el tema financiero. Es, es más recursos o es más tiempo, digamos, lo que necesitamos. Y comparto con él cuando se habla de tiempo, porque si vamos a ver el tema de salvaguardas con pueblos indígenas, tenemos que hacer todo un proceso de mediación cultural, todo el tema de llevarlo a los idiomas, todo el tema del entendimiento. Digamos, ahí nos va a llevar mucho más eh, tiempo, digamos, de hacerlo. Y previo a eso también planteaba el tema de los conflictos. ¿Cómo va a crearse un conflicto entre la aplicación de la norma eh, propia de los pueblos indígenas, de los sistemas propios y cómo eh, se va a aplicar el tema de la legislación nacional? Ahí va a haber un conflicto, digamos, a la hora de querer hablar de derecho de pueblos indígenas en el tema de, de salvaguardas. Ok, gracias. Um, Sorry, we missed the first part of the translation, but I assume your, your question was directed at Candido? Sorry. No, no. Uh, Mika. Oh, was Mika, sorry. Mika, please. Sí. Um, I, I didn't understand it as a question, but more as, a, as an agreement on the importance of time. Sorry, could you say that again? I said um, I didn't understand it as a question, but more as, a, as an agreement on the importance of given, giving time to the process. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Sorry, if you had anything to add to that, or if anybody else would like to add to that, exactly. that is excellent. Yeah, um, if I may, uh, on, on this issue of preventing conflict, um, it's, it's a question for, for all the panelists and for the audience. Uh, what's, what's the good number of people do you need to talk to to make sure that you have prevented conflicts? It's, 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 it's a mystery to me how the self-selection process uh, can work so that you have the right people to assess that, uh, that the key conflicts within a society have been uh, detected and, and, and addressed. Uh, from, from my very theoretical background, uh, it, it's, it re remains very complicated to see. So any, any insights on that would be most welcome. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that will be a, a question, a, an issue for further discussion um, with, with the rest of the panel as we move along. Toby, please. Um, well, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and, and take the question that you were going to ask me um, at the beginning, which is how to integrate traditional knowledge into uh, an indigenous knowledge into these processes and turn it to the people who have far more legitimacy to, to answer it, which will be Ramiro and, and Candido. I think that... Um, recognition of the importance of traditional and, and, and local knowledge is gaining ground, and rightly so. Um, but I think we've enormously underestimated how incredibly challenging this is. The IPBS process has dedicated a lot of attention to discussing it, but they're having huge difficulty in actually doing it. Um, so I will be very interested in, in hearing from the experiences of my panel colleagues of what, what uh, engagement they have already had in trying to to, to integrate, to compile together information from very different mental models, from very different value systems. Okay, thank you, Toby. Perhaps, um, Candido, um, if the translation is following well, and I'd like to thank the translators, and I'm sorry, I will try and speak more slowly. Um, but uh, do you, are you able to provide some experience in, in how as you said, traditional knowledge and systems have been integrated or are being integrated in the development of systems in either Panama or other countries you're familiar with? Sí. Eh, bueno, tenemos, estamos dando seguimiento a diferentes modelos que se están dando por pueblos indígenas en diferentes partes. Pero me quisiera referir al caso de Panamá. Cuando hablamos de, de cómo se aplica el conocimiento, uno de los elementos que aplicamos en Panamá es, por ejemplo, una metodología del Baluwala, que es un vocablo indígena guna, pero que se aplica por todos los pueblos indígenas de su acuerdo a su socio particularidad 
y característica propia de cada pueblo. Algunas más desarrolladas que otras. Para ponerte un ejemplo práctico del conocimiento, en Panamá se desarrolló un programa de adaptación y cambio climático por algunos millones de dólares. Al final lo que se estaba construyendo era un mecanismo de construir un sistema de alerta temprana, una de las actividades. Se preparó, se contrataron expertos, eh, expertos en clima, ingenieros, hidrólogos, pero nunca se preguntaron por qué estaban los viejos allí. Después de dos años vino la gran tormenta en el año 2010 y antes que fueran las inundaciones y antes que estuvieran arrasadas las comunidades, ya los viejos sabían que pasando 10 días de lluvia, la primera comunidad se iba a inundar. Después de cinco días más de lluvia, cuatro comunidades más iban a ser arrasados. Y lo avisaron con un mes de anticipación. Porque la corriente iba bajando lentamente. Nadie hizo caso. Cuatro comunidades quedaron arrasadas por las aguas. ¿Qué demuestra eso? Cuando le preguntamos a los viejos si ellos sabían, dicen, pero si es que me preguntaran primero, lo que invirtieron dos millones, yo no le hubiera cobrado nada. O sea, hay un conocimiento tradicional vivo que la gente no se pregunta. Entonces, ese tipo de conocimiento es bueno, ¿cómo desarrollarlo en la práctica? ¿Cómo se liga esto a un sistema de salvaguarda? Tenemos entonces el mismo caso de red. ¿Cómo hacer que las cosas funcionen antes de que ocurran? Oportunamente. Es lo que debe, debe subsistir de un sistema de salvaguarda. Un sistema de información que sea oportuno, ágil, antes de que ocurra. Y no un sistema de mitigación posterior o que reaccione después. Nos damos cuenta entonces que en el caso de Panamá, algo que surgió después de todas las complicaciones que tuvimos, y aquí tenemos que reconocer la, la, la visión que tuvo uno de, uno de los importantes personas dentro del programa de ONU Red, Chuck McNeil, decir, queremos crear ahora un mecanismo de... Eh, quejas como una forma de reaccionar pero nosotros decimos está bien como forma de salvaguarda como mecanismo de salvaguarda pero un mecanismo de salvaguarda que debe tener cómo hacer lo que se cumpla y no que simplemente se acumulen las quejas o reaccione de acuerdo a las necesidades sino que reaccione oportunamente El conocimiento tradicional tiene el mismo concepto del Baluguala en todos los pueblos indígenas. Trata de tener ese conocimiento oportunamente, enseñarlo y prevenir. El sistema de salvaguarda debe ser eso, prevención. Y no esperar que ocurra para después entonces entrar a resolucionar conflictos. No, debe ser preventivo. Así deberían funcionar los sistemas de salvaguarda. Thank you very much, Candido. Um, I think just in interest of time, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next question. Um, we've got, oh, we're actually out of time. I'm sorry. I was just having so much fun listening to the, to the explanations and the questions, I wasn't looking at my watch. Not a very good moderator, apparently, uh, moderator and um, too used to the United Nations going over time. So, um, thank you everyone on the panel. Um, it's been a great discourse and I apologize to the audience. I 
failed in the, uh, the objective of allowing you time to ask questions, but I think we did get a broad range of views and experience and hopefully some learnings that uh, you can carry on to your work. And I'd like to thank C4 for the event and for arranging this uh, panel. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.